Here is a sample data set for the recent activity, uh, measurement activity we did with inductors. The top graph, the potential versus time, has dots. I've actually removed the line to emphasize the nature of how we are recording data. We are recording data only once every so-called some time interval. So it's not a continuous data collection, it's just a very tiny time interval occurs and then there's a new data point and a new data point and a new data, new data point. So it's not continuous data collection. So this speaks to a little bit of how fast we can record data is going to be a limiting factor for what we can actually see happening if there are things that are happening really quickly in a circuit. And what we have is this circuit with the 5 volt power supply. Uh, we have a current meter that is in series. We have a voltage meter that is measuring the voltage across the inductor. And the inductor is placed in series with a 10 ohm resistor. Uh, the inductor happens to be a 5 millihenry inductor, and we can connect it to the switch, or we can not connect it to the switch. And so when we connect it to the switch, what we get in this little instant, voltage is staying low, staying low, staying low, and then we turn it on, and then there's a big spike, and then it drops back down, and then it just levels off to some constant voltage until we shut it off. The current does something rather interesting too. Um, it's not as dramatic as what the inductor is doing. It's pretty constant. And then at the moment we turn the inductor on, it goes up and stays at about 0.3 amps. And then just stays there constantly. So the voltage and the current, when they are in their so-called steady state, the non-changing parts, this is where things are just proceeding according to Ohm's law. The total resistance of this circuit is 15 ohms. The inductor also has a small resistance, I'll say R sub L, if you measure it with a multimeter, it is 5 ohms. And that's because the inductor really is, is this big spool of wire that's really long, and so a long chunk of wire actually offers some resistance. So the total resistance of this whole circuit is still, it's 10 ohms, that's from up here, plus the 5 ohms from the inductor, and we have 15 ohms. If I do an Ohm's law calculation for how much current can pass through, that means voltage divided by resistance will give me current. That means I have 5 volts over, not 10, but 15 ohms. This will give me 0.33 amps. The other thing we can look at is the resistor is going to be one voltage drop. We'll call that V1. And then the inductor will be another voltage drop. And so since the resistor has twice the resistance of the inductor, it's going to drop the voltage more. The maximum possible voltage, that's 5 volts, so this would represent the drop of voltage 1, and this would represent the drop of voltage 2, and the rule of series resistors and voltage drops across resistors still holds. So for constant current, we can treat this circuit as just a simple two resistor circuit. And you can go back and review the rules for series resistors and the currents and the voltages present. What we want to focus on here though, what the inductor can do is something incredibly fast. And this is where, this is where the interesting things happen with inductors. It happens when things change. And so the current, I'm going to use a different color to go off on this discussion here. The current changes rather abruptly when you turn the circuit from the off position to the on position. And it is this abrupt change in current that can generate a very high voltage spike, but it quickly levels off. If we consider the inductor, um, the current that goes into it is going to
induce a voltage in one coil over. I'll draw this out a little bigger. So if I consider here is one loop of the inductor and here is another loop in the inductor and then it keeps going on. The current that goes through initially, let's say we start going from zero to something, this first loop of current is going to generate another current actually going in the opposite direction. So I'm going to get another current going in the opposite direction, which will then induce yet another current going forward on my original loop. It gets pretty complicated, and when you consider all of the loops, you get a whole bunch of induced currents that go back and forth between each one. The net effect of all of this is an induced voltage, the voltage spike that we observe. And the overall voltage spike, we have this relationship where the induced voltage, V induced, is equal to minus L times the change in current over the change in time. And actually, if we watch this happen a lot faster, there's going to be a drop in voltage, then a big voltage, and it's going to go back and forth and back and forth if we were to watch this at a fast enough sample rate. This quantity L is what we call the inductance. So we can define the unit of inductance based on current, voltage, and time. So the voltage is, of course, in volts. Current is in amps, seconds, or time is in seconds. The inductance is in a new unit. It is called the Henry. It's named after Joseph Henry, a physicist at Princeton in the early 19th century who invented the electromechanical relay, basically the foundation for a telegraph. And he didn't patent it. Um, he would have made a lot of money if he had, uh, but he was okay with that. And so I encourage you to go read about Joseph Henry and his contributions to physics and engineering. So the Henry here can be defined. One Henry is the same as a volt times a second divided by an amp. But hey, wait a minute. We can look at Ohm's law. V equals IR or V over I equals R. That means volts over amps is the same as resistance. It's an ohm. So we can also look at a Henry as an ohm times a second. There's many different interpretations of a Henry based on the different ways you cut the units. That also makes this pretty complicated. You're dealing with changes in time and you're dealing with different ways you can define the unit of the Henry, the unit of inductance. So there's many different approaches. Um, this is just a start, but just pointing out here that we can define the Henry one way or define it another, multiple perspectives for the same quantity. So an induced voltage is based on this property of an inductor or this property of inductance this depends on the parameters of the inductor. So the amount of inductance you can get, this depends on number of loops, size of loops, separation of loops. All of those geometric parameters, the physical parameters of how you've wound the coil of your inductor. And the other thing the induced voltage will depend on is how big of a current spike over which particular time interval. So if your time interval to go from no current to a bunch of current is really short, you can generate some pretty big voltages. So this is a useful thing in some places. If you want to start a car, you actually use what's called a starter motor to change current rapidly to generate a high voltage. In power transmission systems, changes in current, abrupt changes in current, can actually 
create high voltages, which then cause sparks. And if your power transmission system is in a remote rural area over dry brush, that's a problem. Um, we're going to continue this in another video where we'll deconstruct the decay of the curve.